all our celebrations are right. And so, all right, there we go. A reason for celebration. And uh, so I hope everybody celebrates big time today. Amen. Because we are free, not only outwardly, but inwardly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But, you know, it's uh, just, just good to come in here and exercise our freedom. Thank God we're not looking over our shoulders fixing to be taken away for worshiping the Lord. Amen this morning. I'm just so glad about that. Uh, you know, they did a great job of singing the national anthem this morning. I didn't ask them to do that. I was going to just do a video, and they said, well, why don't we just do it? And I said, okay. <laughs> I've seen that one butchered before, but they did a great job. Amen. So uh, I just appreciate them doing that. Uh, you know, there's actually four different verses uh, to the national anthem officially. Well, I say officially, but I found out there was a fifth one. There's actually a fifth verse to the national anthem. I want to read it to you. In fact, you can find the, some people sing, I think Sandy Patty's got a version. It's really long. That's why we didn't do it. It has all four verses, but there's a fifth one that was added in 1861 by Oliver Wendell Holmes. And I'm not going to sing it. All right, but I'm going to read the, read the lyrics this morning and uh, they're powerful. But it says, when our land is illumined with liberty's smile, if a foe from within strike a blow at her glory, down, down with the traitor that dares to defile the, the flag of her stars and the page of her story. By the millions unchained who our birthright have gained, we will keep her bright blazon forever unstained, and the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave while the land of the free is the home of the brave. That's powerful. And, you know, our, our, it was written during the beginning of the Civil War, of course. But, you know, our, our real enemy is not outward. It's not flesh and blood. But we have to remember it's the enemy, uh, the adversary working behind the scenes. And he's trying to stir up strife and division and all kinds of stuff in our nation again. And we need to recognize who our enemy is, is, is Satan and his forces of darkness that are behind it. But we also need to recognize and accept and walk in our authority as believers and shut his plans down. Amen. Don't be a part of his plan. Don't be a participant, but be someone who comes against his plans and shuts it down. And uh, our nation has stood through a lot of things before, but Thank God that uh, God's, uh, God actually founded this nation on the right principles. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to just talk about American history. We're actually going to talk about uh, the why, how we came into being and what, what's the foundation for what we're celebrating today on the 4th of July. And, you know, if you really look, if you do a, a true and honest assessment of our nation's history, I know it's been watered down, rewritten, changed, and all those kind of things. But if you really go back to the very foundational uh, things that started our country, you find out that it was really founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, if it weren't for the gospel of Jesus being proclaimed uh, beforehand, it, this nation would never have come into being. And, you know, you really look, at, we're celebrating, you know, what happened on the 4th of July 1776, uh, you know, we're approaching 250 years. It's just the next few years uh, on that. I remember when it was a bicentennial. That's kind of how old I am. But uh, anyway, but, you know, we're celebrating that particular date. But there was something that led up to that date and the reason for the Declaration of Independence being written. And it's what we call the Great Awakening One. Now, the Great Awakening One was really the beginning of the American Revolution. Now, the American Revolution, of course, is not just the Revolutionary War. It was a actually a revolution in the change of thinking and the heart belief system that was in the hearts of the people in our country. We had 13 colonies, and um, in fact, this is my 13th message. I found out the 13th message in this particular series, so I, it just kind of worked out. But anyway, we had 13 colonies, and they were very loosely, you know, just kind of thrown together. They really weren't united until the Great Awakening won. And uh, we had uh, ministers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and Samuel Davies and among others who went out and proclaimed the gospel, I mean, by horseback. We're not talking about what we have today, social media and 
you know, internet and all those kind of things. We're talking about, you know, they went on horseback. George Whitchfield, he had a, a podium. He'd throw it on the back of his horse and take off. He wore himself down. In fact, he reached about half of all the colonists personally heard the gospel through his ministry. I mean, that is astounding if you, you think about the kind of miles and the kind of things that he had to do from one town to another, and they were all scattered out all over the place. But we had over, you know, we had about 2 million people at the time in those colonies, and over half of them were, were touched by that man's ministry and others. And they heard the gospel message. But it really wasn't just a religious message. It was the power of the gospel, the revelation of it, that, got, that they preached and got in the hearts of the people in that area. Uh, in, in the colonists, and that's really what united the 13 colonies. They were all united around the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it had such an influence and impact uh, on our nation and, and such a revolutionary uh, impact and influence on even our, our form of government. That is really what spawned our nation. That's what gave birth to our nation. It was really birthed by God himself because of the gospel. And of course, the gospel has everything to do with what we've been talking about on Sunday morning, the new covenant. And uh, so the nation was founded on that. And that's the reason that they, they be began to get a vision for freedom and independence, not just outwardly, but inwardly. And of course, that's, that gives way to independence outwardly. You know, you can't really live free on the outside if you're not free on the inside. In fact, just because you have a natural birth here in this country and you have birthrights here does not really mean that you are living a free life. You can be all bound up on the inside. You need to be born again, not just born into America, but you need to be born into the kingdom of God. And that's what they got a hold of. In fact, you know, some of the things that are being told in written now about our, our founding fathers are just not true, that they were just secularist and humanist and everything else, and that's just not true. And they pick on people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, and they say, well, see there, you know, they, they were kind of nominal Christians. Let me tell you something. They were way above the average, even those two are way above the average of most of the believers today in our country. They were heavily influenced by George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, uh, Ben Franklin was very, very good friends with them. And he was heavily influenced by that. And, you know, you go back to their original quotes and you kind of find out that that was indeed the case. And uh, I'm just going to read just a couple of quotes real quickly for you uh, from some of our founding fathers. Not going to read a whole lot, but it kind of gives you a tasting and a sampling of really uh, what, what kind of vision they had. Now, were, were they perfect? No. Absolutely not. You know, this, this nation wasn't built on, perf, you know, perfect people. It was built on a perfect gospel and a perfect Lord. And, you know, that's really what we go back to. We can't get our eyes on governments and on men because they will always let you down. We have things, we have issues in our country that need to be changed. But how are we going to change that? Well, it's not going to come out of some kind of man-made institution. It's going to come the same way that it's always come is through the gospel. Anything that's really come good for our nation, any good changes that have come, has come because of some kind of an awakening and some kind of a revival of the gospel of Jesus, the influence of the gospel of Jesus. But anyway, but uh, just, just a sampling real quick. Um, we were just talking about Thomas Jefferson. You know, he had a quote uh, that went along this line. He said, I am a real Christian. Went, well, that's his own words right there. He said, I am a real Christian, that is to say a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus. I have little doubt that our whole country will soon be rallied to the unity of our creator, and I hope to the pure doctrine of Jesus also. I mean, I don't know how, how much more clear you can get than that. Um, uh, T uh, John Adams, one of the chief founding fathers, he said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. You know, he was a part of that. He's looking back on that. Um, it, uh, let's see, uh, Patrick Henry, strong believer. Patrick Henry uh, said this. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often 
that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. There's a difference there. Not on religious, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that reason alone, people of other faiths have been afforded freedom of worship here. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States and the son of John Adams, we just quoted earlier, said, The highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Now, I know, it, you know, a quote that actually was taken not from the Constitution, but from some correspondence of Thomas Jefferson to somebody else, they kind of founded that whole separation of church and state and said, you know, that, that just tells you that, you know, the church shouldn't have, have any influence on, on the, the state government. That's not true. That's not what he was saying at all. What he was arguing was the state better keep its nose out of the church's business and not take its freedoms and liberties away. That's what he was arguing for. And that was twisted and turned around. And, and now, as you know, they've, they said, well, you know, if you're a believer, you can't say anything. You can't, you can't stand for anything. You can't talk about, you know, anything uh, regarding issues of the country. Well, let me tell you something. We need to talk about that. We need to know where we stand as far as the word goes. We, our beliefs need to be influenced and impacted because of what the word said not just personal opinion, not because of somebody else, social media or anything else, but from the Word of God. What are we basing our beliefs on? And see, we all need to go back to the foundation that the country is based on, which is the Word. The Word will straighten out the problems. It will correct things. Even if there's imperfections, and first of all, it's going to straighten out us personally, individually. It needs to straighten out us. But anyway, um, John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, how about this? said it this way, only one, ad, uh, only one adequate plan has ever appeared in the world, and that is the Christian dispensation. I mean, it, you know, the, if, uh, it, if, if this is not clear, I don't know what is. Ben Franklin, here we go, all right? One of the ones that been criticized. It says, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? So they were trusting in the Lord. That's what gave birth to our country right here. Um, Noah Webster. No, Webster's Dictionary. You know, he was a, a real influencing member of the Founding Fathers. He said... The moral principles and precepts contained in the scripture ought to form the basis of all of our civil constitutions and laws. And it was. All the miseries and evil men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the pre precepts contained in the Bible. Um. Benjamin Rush, he, you know, he's not really one of the well-known ones, but he had a major influence in our early education system and in the foundation of our, of our documents, our government documents. He said, I do not believe that the Constitution was the offspring of inspiration, but I am perfectly satisfied that the union of the states in its form and adoption is as much the work of divine providence as any of the miracles report, recorded in the Old and the New Testaments. They attributed this to the miracle supernatural power of God, this, the birth of this nation. There's no way that this really, this country ever should have been founded. I mean, without the hand of God, it wouldn't have been. One more, John Adams, again, one of the leading fa founding fathers says, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. In other words, what he's saying right there is that people need to be governed from within, not just governed from without. When we refuse to be governed from within, you know, by the principles of the Word of God, by God Himself, 
then we tend to end up having to have more laws put on the books and more external government to control the masses. And you know, again, we, we, don't have an, we can't build enough prisons to hold people if we do not educate them in the Word of God. And that is our job. That is what this country was based on. And in fact, you see that the founding fathers not only wanted to just start a country here where we can just live independently and just heap all kinds of things to ourselves and all the prosperity to ourselves. The real vision of the country that they received was it was founded on the gospel of Jesus and for the gospel of Jesus. In other words, we, are, we were supposed to be a nation that proclaimed the gospel of Jesus to all the other nations of the world. That is our purpose. That was God's original uh, uh, purpose for this country. And to some degree, over the years, we've drifted off of that, drifting back on it, whatever. But, you know, it really comes back down to that once again. And, you know, while I'm ministering this morning, you know, while we're, we're going to be talking about the foundations for our freedom this morning and uh, how to live freely, not just, you know, just being an American, not just celebrating, shooting some fireworks, all but how to live free every other day of the year because you need to live from the inside out. But as we're doing this, we also need to make this a time of recommitting ourselves to the furtherance of the gospel. Whether you are one that's going to be sent overseas or you're going to send somebody, and I see that we have missionaries here this morning from the missionary field. Carrie and Corinthian Allen, of course, they're back. Just be with us uh, for a weekend. But I tell you, God's doing some great things. Uh, they've been in Haiti for three years now. Y'all going to stay there one year, right? <laughs> and y'all been there three, but the Lord's expanded that. They're going into the Dominican Republic. Uh, that is a, that's good ground. But see, that is what the purpose of our country is all about. Now, whether you're called to go or not, you're called to sin one way or another. And we're called to live it. And so we appreciate them being with us this morning. And we honor our missionaries. I tell you, among uh, everybody else, uh, uh, we honor our military, of course, the people who have given their lives for us. But we also, the missionaries, I think, all, all ought to be in that category as well because they have been the ones... They're doing, they're taking the gospel around the world. You know, all of us should have that commitment to do that. And, you know, I know it's, it's important to have strong opinions politically and all those kind of things. But if that is as far as you ever go, you are missing the mark. If you just have a strong opinion and you're just going to just talk about stuff, even put stuff, post stuff on social media, nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But is that, if that is as far as you go in your commitment, you're going to have to reassess your commitment because your commitment needs to be to live it. Your, your commitment needs to be a, a proclaimer, a preacher of the gospel of Christ. And yes, all of us are called to do that because that is really what's going to bring freedom to our country. That's really what's going to cause uh, the problems and the situations in our country right now to be resolved. It's not going to come from man. It's certainly not going to come from the federal government. They are more confused than the average person up there. So it's going to come from the grassroots. It's going to come from us. Yeah, uh, you know, God never called and, and formed a government to provide for people, to solve problems. But we've elevated them and put them in a position that they were never uh, ordained and called to do. And we're putting pressure on them to do things and solve problems they aren't, they aren't uh, you know, qualified to do. The government's there to do one thing, and that's to keep control and, and to make, make sure that things are organized and keep, you know, just being chaotic. We need organization and, and justice. But at the same time, we also need to understand our personal role and responsibility as citizens that we're to believe the gospel, we're to live the gospel, and we're to proclaim the gospel. Amen? And that is the way we're going we're gonna to live free. That's the way that God is going to provide for us. There's a reason that we have prosperity in our country. It's not because of the institutions. It's not because of our great capitalist system. It's because of God's blessing on our country because it was founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And see, that, is, that is, has to be our commitment. We need to be sold out to this. In fact, we need to be as sold out as our founding fathers in committing to make sure that this is carried on to another generation. Because, you know, at this point... You know, I'm looking to the next generation. I want them to enjoy the same freedoms and the same things that we have enjoyed. 
But in order to do that, we're going to have to have a commitment to give our life for this. Now, that doesn't mean we're all called to the ministry, but we need to give our life for this. And see, we need to reassess what's in our own heart. Are we, is that a priority in our life, or are we just messing around with this? Do we agree with it mentally, or are we sold out to it? The founding fathers had to be sold out because when they put their name on that document, you know, almost uh, 240-something years ago, almost 250 years ago, they were taking their life in their own hand because they could be tried and tarred, feathered, and hung. I mean, you know, it was, they, were, they were going to put their health, their wealth, their whole reputation on the line for this principle. And it wasn't just the, the country itself. It was the vision that they received from God through the gospel. Everybody here today? All right, so let's, let's start in our Bibles this morning to John 8. I'm not going to keep you too long this morning because I know we have celebrations and things to get to. But I do wanted to make sure that we are not just going through the motions, doing something religious today, but we're going to have an impact. I mean, this could be a day where we recommit, where we rededicate thing, our life to this, and uh, also to, not just to proclaim it, but to live it. Amen? And if we're not free, why aren't we living free? You know, even if you're born here, you have certain fr freedoms, of course, afforded to you in the Bill of Rights, but that doesn't guarantee that you're going to live a free life necessarily. So let's uh, find out from what Jesus said here to begin with in John chapter 8. And uh, let me get over here real quick. I've been talking and not turning, so as usual. But notice it says, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, so notice they were Jews who believed him. They were believers. He said, If you abide or live in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So notice there's a commitment that goes beyond just being a Christian, just being that initial Christian. There's a difference, a, dis a distinguishing mark between just a simple believer, when someone is born again, and a disciple. What is that? It's when you begin to live in the Word and the Word lives in you. And notice once that happens, once you make that commitment to the Word of Jesus, which is the New Covenant, the Gospel, then notice it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. See, that is the truth that you personally know that's going to cause freedom in your life. Yes, thank God for the external freedoms we have here. Thank God for that. I know this is not a perfect nation, but I don't see people lining up to leave. I see people lining up to try to get over here. You know, when I was looking through the, the videos, uh, just trying to find some videos for this morning. One of them, the Star Spangled Banner. There's just tons of them on there. But anyway, I started looking at the comments. And I like to look at comments. I want to see where people are at sometimes. So I started getting looking at all the comments in the comments section on YouTube. And uh, one after another, of course, people were all you know moved by these videos and this music. And they were very patriotic, very excited. But I saw a whole bunch of people because it's, it's an in, international audience, I saw a whole bunch of people from other countries says, this is my dream country. I'm going to come here someday. Because they were living in an oppressive, bad government, in a bad country somewhere. They were lying up. They wanted, to, they wanted what we have right now. You know, sometimes we take this for granted. But listen, this is a time to thank God for what we have. I tell you, I, thank God I was born here. I mean, a lot of people, they were born somewhere else, came in here. They appreciate what we have here more than we do because they've been in oppressive governments. They've seen what it's like, you know, to have governments that just oppress people and you line up and you don't have enough to eat and all those kind of things. Thank God that we really don't, we haven't had that kind of experience to that degree here in this country. So I tell you, you know, don't ever complain about what's going on here. Thank God for what we have and believe God for to, to fix the stuff that's wrong here. Yeah, there are things. We don't deny what, what's going on, but it's people problems. It's not, it's not so much what God has given us as a stewardship, it's people problems. And those are all worked out when we get the gospel in people. When we start living from the inside out, living a free life from the inside out. And it starts right here, knowing the truth. Knowing the truth will make you free. Knowing the truth will make you free. And then verse 36, notice this. Verse 36, it reads this way. It says, therefore, if the Son makes you free. Notice it's the Son that makes you free. It's not the government. 
It's not really even the Constitution or Bill of Rights. Those things are in line with this right here. Nobody's going to make you free. It's the Son that makes you free. If the Son makes you free, notice, you will be free indeed. I like to say it this way. If you, uh, we, we put it in our modern day language, we can be and live free to the max. Listen, we have external freedoms now, but what about internally? That true life of freedom comes from the inside out, and only Jesus can give you that. Only Jesus, through the gospel that you hear and believe, can make you free. Glory to God. Now, are we living free today? Well, the degree to which you walk in this freedom that we're talking about right here is the degree to which you know the truth that's been revealed to you which comes down to you abiding or committing to the Word of God. And that's what we've been talking about for a number of weeks here. Now, I like also the uh, Passion Translation of verse 36. Passion Translation of verse 36 reads this way, So if the Son sets you free from sin, then become a true Son and be unquestionably free. Become a, a, become a Son and, be, and live that life of being unquestionably free free. I like that right there. He said, if the sun sets you free. Now, what are we free from? You know, we're talking about freedom. What are we actually free from? Well, there's actually three categories, and you can put a lot of things in these categories, and we're not going to go through these this morning. There's three categories of things that you are free from. Number one, we know sin, right? We know that we're free from sin. There's a lot of stuff that's just attached to sin. You know, condemnation, guilt, shame, uh, sickness and disease, oppression, all those things, the curse of the law, all of those things spawned from sin and the fall of man. There was a lot of fallout from the fall, and we've all experienced that in our life. Anything bad that we've experienced? Is somebody shooting fireworks out there? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that's okay if they want to celebrate, all right? But they need to know why we're celebrating. We'll, we'll turn the speakers out externally out there. We'll give them some fireworks. But anyway, you know, we're talking about these things right here. We need to understand that we are free from sin. Jesus set us free from sin. He set us free from the condemnation of sin. He set us free from the sin debt that was hanging over our head, from the arrest warrant that was all making us fugitives. All the things that separated us away from God, Jesus, he completely did away from, with sin. In other words, we are forgiven and cleansed of all sin. That's the gospel. That's the centerpiece of the gospel message. But we're also free from Satan and his oppression in our life. Sin, Satan. They go hand in hand, by the way. Satan used sin in order to oppress mankind. Isn't that right? And, of course, there's a lot of things that fall under that category but thank God we're not under his oppression anymore because we're not in his old sorry kingdom. Amen. We've been transferred out. Glory to God. We've been translated out, delivered out of his kingdom and into the kingdom of the son of God's love today. But we're also free from one other thing that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. And that's self. Sin, Satan, and self. Because now we are free not to try to be God of our own life. Now, I'll tell you, that is a frustrating road to hoe when you're trying to be God of your own life. You're trying to provide for yourself, save yourself, solve your own problems. You're trying to take all the cares, all the burdens of your own life onto yourself and solve them and, and do something about them. And we can go on down the list. But, you know, one of the chief problems that we have is just being self, just self-centered, self-absorbed, you know, just self-occupied. Any real problems and bondages we experience in life as believers is because we got too much focus on self and not enough focus on Jesus. But you know what? Jesus came to deliver us from self. In fact, the very gospel, the very work of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, is, is really the anecdote for self. I mean, it completely takes self out of the picture because you had nothing to do with it. It was all about Jesus, and it's all about him being on the cross paying for the price for your sin. You could not pay it. Jesus paid it for you. So the very revelation of Jesus, the very revelation of the gospel, really cuts the, the foundation of the self and self-centeredness out of the picture. Amen. We have become a society that is self-absorbed. 
We're, we're all about self. We're all about self-pleasure and self-occupation and trying to get ahead in life and being self-made people. There is no such thing. You're either God-made or you're a failure, one or the other. I mean, you're in one category or the other. God wants you to know that you don't have to be God of your own life. You don't have to carry the cares of your own life upon yourself. You don't have to be burdened down in life. You can, be a, you can have peace in life, but the only way you're going to walk in that peace and freedom is for you to turn things over to God and let Him be God of your life. Let Jesus be Lord over your life. Amen? So we are, we are free from those three things. And again, there's just a lot in that category right there. But Jesus said you're free to the max. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I mean, every way possible, you're free indeed. Now, you know, we have a lot of people of you overseas, and they're, they're probably under some of these oppressive governments that we're talking about right here, and they would love to be, have what we have and come over here. Amen? Now, let me tell you something, how to, get, how to live free right now. No matter where you are, it's not coming here that's going to make you free. It's Jesus coming to you that's going to make you free. That is the message of the gospel. That's where freedom starts, is when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, when you are born again and you're made a child of God. See, that can happen in any country. Glory to God. Any country, you can receive the gospel message and be transformed from the inside out. You can be that son whom we're talking about right here. Amen. Now, you know, this really is the message. The message of Jesus is the message of the gospel itself. This is the life-changing message that we all believed and is still changing our life. You know, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, the, the, the cancel culture is trying to cancel out God. That's really what they're after. I mean, they're trying to cancel a lot of stuff out, but they're really trying to cancel Jesus out because the, really the strength of our nation is founded on God and on the gospel of Jesus. And I tell you, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am not going to be ashamed of standing for the gospel. Amen? And we shouldn't be either. Why would we be ashamed of that? This is the message that, sa that saved us and set us free. And I refuse to be canceled. In fact, you can't cancel me out of something I'm not part of anyway. The Bible says we're in the world, but we're not of it. Glory to God. You can't cancel me out. You can't cancel Jesus out. You cannot cancel the gospel out. People who try to do that, they'll be canceled out. I can tell you. But anyway, G, uh, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe it, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, notice right there that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. People are wondering there, they've given up hope about our own country here. How is our country going to be saved? It's because of the same gospel we're talking about. There's no way this country ever should have started. And it certainly shouldn't have survived for almost 250 years. But the reason we're still here is a testimony to the power of salvation that's resident in the gospel. But as we, as we hear the gospel and believe it, listen, that is the power of God to save our country. That's the power of God to save us out of our own self and our own situations. See, when we were beginning to look at that's why I'm saying we need to commit ourselves to living the gospel, believing it, proclaiming it, not be ashamed of it. Don't you dare back off into a corner and become ashamed of the gospel message. That is the one thing that's going to save our country. Glory to God. That's the one thing that's going to preserve our natural uh, freedoms that we enjoy here. It's the freedom we get from the gospel message. And it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, somebody said it this way recently, and I agree with this. It really bore witness with my spirit because the Lord said something similar to me recently. I say, you know, since the beginning of the year, that a lot of people are still looking for another great awakening. We're in, we're, we've already been in the middle of it right now. It's already started. Whether you're aware of it or not, listen, if you're, if you're looking at at the wrong sources of news, you'll never know about it until it's already happened and it's decades, you know, past. You see the results and the effects of it. But listen, we're right in the middle of it right now. I came, I came through one. In fact, this is the reason I'm in the ministry now. And, you know, 40 years ago in the early 80s, there was a great awakening going on right there. 
It was a spiritual great awakening. I'll tell you what, you couldn't, people were in church almost every night. Doing I mean, we were, we were at Bible studies and church. We were doing something almost every night. We were hungry. There was, we would find places to go to hear the Word of God. People were just so hungry for it. I'm, I'm beginning to sense that and see that again. Having come through that, I'm seeing that that's happening again. And listen, I'm, gonna, I'm decided and I'm committed myself to be a proponent of that. I'm going to encourage that every, every step I get. And I'm not the only one, thank God. We're not just a lone ranger out here, praise God, doing our own thing. But we're definitely going to be a part of it. Amen. I believe, our, I believe this congregation is going to be a part of it. And listen, I'm not just looking at the Athens area. I'm looking at the nation. And I'm looking at nations. Jesus said, you'll make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus' vision is. Amen. We've had, we've had missionaries come and go out. We're going to have a lot more. We're going to have some of y'all going out. Amen. And affecting other countries and other nations. Glory to God. Don't get scared and say, I'm not coming here no more. I don't want to be sent to, you know, some Timbuktu or something. Listen, wherever God sends you, is, uh, that's the best place in the world. You say, well, I'm going to stay here and stay safe. Let me tell you something. Uh, safe is not a place. Safe is a position. Amen. And me following God, that's the safest place I can possibly be. Amen. Glory be to God. And you'll be most fulfilled by doing this. See, my life, it, it shouldn't be just by gathering up a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not opposed to prosperity because we need prosperity to get the gospel out. There's a purpose for it. But at the same regard, that's not our purpose in life. It's just to gather a whole bunch of stuff and get comfortable in life. Well, when I get X number of dollars, then I'm, you know, I can do this and I do what I want to do. You ought to be doing what you want to do now. Your want tos need to be lined up with his want tos. Amen. I know this is a little challenging this morning. Amen. But I won't answer to men. I answer him. Praise God. If we need to be stirred up, if we need to be touched in our heart, if we need to recommit, we need to be challenged, we need to be corrected, we need to have that. Amen. And I tell you, this is a good time to do it. We need to recommit ourselves to doing this, living this out, being, being a part of the solution. Amen? Not just pointing out problems, but being a part of the solution, which is right here rooted in the gospel message. Hallelujah. I'm still a young man. I've got a lot to go. Praise God. Some people ask me, are you going to retire? No, I'm not. I may re reshift and refocus some of them ministry here and there, but I'm not retiring. I don't plan on retiring. No, this is my calling. You don't retire from a calling, folks. There ain't no way in the world. Glory to God. I couldn't, I, I would be miserable sitting around doing nothing. Not proclaiming. Paul said it this way. He said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. We need to have that same commitment. You know, the early church had this commitment, didn't they? They had that commitment to the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. They reached the whole known world in their, their generation in about 30 years. And that without social media and satellite and all this other stuff that we have today. But they did it. I'm telling you what, they blazed a trail. And it wasn't just religion. You can't just talk people in. They had the power of God manifesting in their midst. I'm talking about signs and wonders and miracles. And see, that's what we're going to have as well. Because Jesus said, I will confirm my word, not your word, but my word with signs following, accompanying signs. So I'm expecting the signs and the wonders and the miracles. Every time I, I tell somebody about Jesus, something is going to happen. may not always be spectacular, but let me tell you something. It's always going to be supernatural. The very gospel itself is rooted in the supernatural and the miraculous. Amen. And see, this is the kind of gospel that we proclaim. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And then verse 17 says, for in it, in the gospel is a revelation of the righteousness of God by faith. Amen. That leads one from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Amen. I tell you, during that, you know, the time I came in, there were some miraculous things happening. But people were expecting it. Expectation was high. The hunger level was high. Again, I'm seeing that begin to rise back up in the people. 
over the last couple of years particularly. There's so much uncertainty in the world today. So uncertainty in, in as far as health and uncertainty as far as, you know, the pandemic and the economic scene and instability in governments. All these things right there have created uncertainty. The only stability we have in life is right here. It's the word of the living God. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for peace in their life. You're not going to find peace outside of believing the gospel. You're not going to find solutions to life's problems outside of believing the gospel message. It is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? See, this is the same message that Jesus was anointed to preach. So let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke, the fourth chapter today. And uh, look at this. Uh, you know, this is a scripture that the Lord has me go to quite often. But, you know, Jesus, very beginning of his ministry, his inaugural message was found right here in Luke chapter 4. In fact, he had found himself and found the, really, uh, this particular passage for his ministry over in the Old Covenant in Isaiah. But notice here in uh, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse number 16 is where we're going to read today. This is Jesus' own words. But notice it says he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Verse 17, it says, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. So he was looking for this place. He didn't just open it up and say, All right, I'm going to start right here. He was actually looking for this scripture right here. So look at verse 18. This is what it reads from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice right there he said, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me for this purpose, for this reason right here. What was it? To preach the gospel. What is the gospel message? It's the, it's the message of Jesus it's the message of the finished work of Christ, what God did for us that we could not do for ourselves. Amen. It is the message of the new covenant that we've been talking about. You know, if, if the old covenant law of Moses could have done it, then Jesus would have said, well, you just need more law. You know, you just need to do the law better, and then you'll be free from this stuff. No, he said it, he knew it wasn't through that. There is no, there's no answer that originates from self. And see, the law was all about what we could do, keeping the law to produce our own right standing in favor with God. But what Jesus introduced was the righteousness of faith. In other words, believing the gospel message and then becoming righteous or forgiven of all sins and then walking back into the blessing of God, letting God bless us in spite of us, not because of us. Amen? And that's really what this whole message of the gospel is about. Now I want you to notice what the effects of that gospel message are when we believe it. It is the power of God unto salvation. He says, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To preach the gospel to the poor. Now I know, you know, we could say poor would involve a lot of things. You can be poor in health. You can be poor in mental health. You can be poor uh, in finances. In fact, this, this word right here for poor is always translated in regards to having lack financially. You know, God doesn't want you lacking financially. Why? Because that limits what you can do for him many times. God doesn't want you limited in what you can do for him. So what, what is the answer for that? What is found in the gospel message? Isn't that right? The gospel message actually includes the message of provision God's way. And how does God provide more than enough? He's El, Sh El Shaddai, not El Sh Chipo. We, we have to understand that. So it says to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To, uh, the, the word heal means to cure or to get rid of the effects of sin of the brokenhearted. Now, who are the brokenhearted? Brokenhearted, translated here, means those who are broken down and crushed. Those who are oppressed by Satan. Those who have been just stepped upon and trampled upon in life. 
Those are the brokenhearted. And Jesus said the answer is in the gospel message. The healing cure is in the gospel message for those who are brokenhearted. All of us have experienced brokenheartedness at some degree or another. Being crushed in life, being disappointed, frustrated, oppressed in life, some more than others. But you know what? The gospel message is the answer for the cure of that stuff. He said, I'm coming to preach you a message. If you'll believe it, the power of God unto salvation will hit your life and it will heal the brokenhearted. I love that. He said he is, and to proclaim liberty to the captives. Notice that. To proclaim liberty to the captives. The Beck translation reads it this way. He said, I've come to announce to the prisoners, you are free. I love that. Just really in your face. I've just come to announce to all the prisoners out there, those who are captive, you are free. You're free to walk out of here. Jesus didn't come and bust us out of prison. He came to free us from prison. We're not a, a fugitive on the run with an arrest warrant still hanging over our head with, with serving you know, jail time. We are still, listen, we are free to walk out of there with our heads held high. No condemning sentence, no guilt, and no shame attached to it whatsoever. See, the enemy still uses condemnation, guilt, and shame even to a believer to keep them imprisoned. He gets them to go back into the prison house. Somebody, you know, somebody, a preacher, was talking about this group of uh, prisoners who got born again. And uh, they formed a, a, some kind of a choir or something. And they would go to different, uh, you know, avenues or whatever, and they would sing, you know, as representatives of the prison and, and all that kind of stuff, and they would they'd do the choir. But the problem is, you know, they were singing about Jesus, but then they all had to get back on that prison bus and go back to prison. Listen, that is not a picture of you this morning. We came in here to sing, to celebrate, but you don't have to go back on Satan's prison bus anymore and go back to his prison house. Listen, you, you can say, I don't have to go back in there. I don't have to wear your duds. I don't have to wear those, those clothes anymore. I'm not in stripes anymore. Listen, I am now free to walk out of that prison house, and Satan cannot put you back in it at all. See, this is the freedom that Jesus came to, to, to bring to all of us. We don't have to live our life in a prison, in a prison house. We can be free from that captivity. Jesus said the gospel message is the proclamation of the freedom that we can have today. Glory to God. You know, again, the founding fathers got a hold of this, obviously, because on July 8th, 1776, uh, the Declaration of Independence was read on the steps of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And after that declaration was written or read aloud out there that day, they rang the Liberty Bell. Y'all know what the Liberty Bell is, right? Well, if you've ever seen the Liberty Bell, on the Liberty Bell is an inscription from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. It says to proclaim to all the land the freedom from captivity. And see, it was referring to, in Leviticus 25, it was referring to the year of Jubilee. That was a type and shadow of the freedom we enjoy here in, in, uh, as believers in Jesus. In fact, this whole passage in Isaiah is talking about the fulfillment of the type and shadow of the year of Jubilee. In fact, when he goes on to say that I am to proclaim, the gospel message is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he is referring to the year of Jubilee. And if you go back and look at that, every 50th year, you know, uh, after the seven seventh uh, Sabbaths and, you know, 49 years, on the 50th year, they would sound the trumpet and enter into a year of Jubilee. If you had lost anything, you went back to your original possession and inheritance. If you were in debt, those were canceled. That's where we get, you know, the bankruptcy every seven years is cleared out or supposed to be cleared out of your name. But that's where that came from right there. But Jesus is not just proclaiming, all right, it's the 50th year. Now we're going to proclaim freedom. He's actually saying, I am the fulfillment. I am the year of Jubilee. It's not a year that we look forward to. It is a person and I'm him. And that's why he got up. And that's the message of the gospel of everything that we had lost in the fall is now being restored back to us. 
All the inheritance that we lost, we're going back. But listen, not 100%, but 120%. God is restoring back more to us than what we lost. Anything you've lost in life, even if it was by your own dumb mistakes, and we've all done that, most, most of that's probably what it is. Listen, God will restore back to you through this jubilee that we're talking about right here, through this gospel message, you can believe God for restoration in your life. Glory to God. And listen, if it's been stolen from you, if it's been taken for you, or you just never got it because somebody's been standing in your way, there is a gospel message that tells us that we can have a year of jubilee and have restoration coming back to us again. Now listen, this is not coming from a government. This is coming from God. This is, this is coming from the Lord himself. This is the good news of the gospel. If you have given up years because of an oppressive sickness or disease in your body, you can be healed, made whole, and restored in your life. Glory to God. Man, it, it is such an honor and privilege to come up and proclaim the gospel. Why would anybody be ashamed of this message? It's good news. Good news. News is almost too good to be true. You know, I like the amplified translation of verse number 19 there. Because uh, if you've got that, I don't, I've got other translations here. There it is. It says, to proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. See, this is what Jesus came to pronounce. This is what he came to declare. Now, if he got up and said, well, you know, we all know that in the sweet by and by, this is someday going to happen. Then people would just shout at him down right there. But you know what? He said one word that really just undercut all that religious, traditional idea right there. He goes on and says, is in verse 21, I believe it is. He says, and he began to say to them today, not tomorrow, not in the sweet by and by, not someday uh, we hope to be, trying to be. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You don't have to wait one more day. Today is the day of salvation in every area of your life. In fact, you can get up and ring your own liberty bell right now. You can get up and sound your own horn, your own trumpet of the year of Jubilee and declare your Jubilee. You can walk out of that prison house. You don't have to act like a prisoner. You don't have to think like a prisoner anymore. You don't have to be, live a life all bound up because of Satan's oppression in your life. You can be free today if you'll just believe the gospel message that's been presented to you. Glory to God. No ifs, ands, or buts, nothing else. Listen, just believing with pure faith in the gospel message that God is going to do it. Listen, that freedom starts instantly on the inside. All that, those chains begin to drop off. All that bondage begins to drop off on the inside of you. And listen, it will begin to affect your outward person and your external circumstances. When you get free on the inside, that freedom is going to manifest on the outside. Hallelujah. See, again, that's the reason of the gospel. Even though we got a free country, we need to have free people living in this free country. And this is the only thing, the only way we're going to actually live free is through this gospel message being proclaimed, believed, and received. Yes. Amen. And I tell you, when you get aggressive about this, when you just decide, I'm going to lay it all out on the table, I know I'm not going to believe anything else but this gospel right here. I don't care how long it's been here. I don't how, care how long it's been entrenched in my life, how long Satan has been doing this in my life. Listen, I don't have to live this way one more day. Right. You know, like the woman with the issue of blood, she got a hold of this. She heard about Jesus, this gospel message. And you know what? She just, she just threw caution to the wind, brother. I tell you, she just put our whole commitment in that gospel message right there that she had heard. She just began to say, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. When he comes to town, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. She'd been in that condition for 12 long years. 12 years. And listen, she didn't get better during that 12 years. She got worse and went broke in the process. 
But at that same time, she began to gather hope because of this gospel message right here. And she saw Jesus come into town, and she said, this is my day. I'm going down there to act on it. And it's one thing to talk about it, but it, it comes down to, to doing it at some point in time. So she made her way, and there's a crowd, a whole crowd of people around Jesus that day. She could have been stoned under the law for being out in that condition. But you know what? She, did that, that made, she kept her focus squarely on Jesus that day. She made her way through the press behind, touched the hem of his garment. The Bible says she was instantly made whole. The power of God entered into her. Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? Well, there was a whole bunch of people touching him. But they were not touching him the way this woman did. This woman touched him in faith, believing, drawing on the power of God because she believed this gospel of freedom right here. And she finally, you know, she said, well, I've been caught. So she told him everything. She started at five years old and went through the whole thing. <laughs> the whole details, man, details, the amplified version of this thing. And Jesus said, daughter, he called her daughter. See, there's the, there's the relationship right there. He said, daughter, daughter, insider, not outsider. We're sons now. We're daughters. We're children of God. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's the way, that's who you are. You're not a prisoner anymore. You're not an outsider. You're not a condemned, you know, felon. You are free to have this right now. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Satan worked 12 long years on her case. He thought, man, she's getting worse and worse and worse. But one believing day changed everything. You know what she did? She proclaimed her freedom. She heard the gospel jubilee message, and she got up and proclaimed her freedom and then acted like it was so. It took an aggressive act, but I tell you, brother, the power of God hit her, and it cleared all that thing up immediately. You see case after case. Some of us may have the same testimony. Satan has just been oppressing us, keeping us in his prison house, Wearing prison clothes, singing in the prison choir, and get back on the prison bus. But listen, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You can just break out of that thing right now. You can say, there's no prison and there's no prison big enough to hold me. I can tell you right now. I am free. He whom the sun sets free is free to the max. I'm free in every regard. Spirit, soul, body, in every regard. I am free indeed. And see, where does that come from? Believing the gospel message. See, a lot of times we're looking for something complicated. We're looking for God to do some writing in the sky when it, it's written down here. All we have to do is mix our faith with it and believe it. And we'll experience the same manifested freedom as all these people do. You know, Jesus, of course, got run out of town in his hometown because they really didn't recognize who he was and they didn't appreciate his message at all. And they said, is this just Joseph's son? They say they just saw him naturally. They didn't see who he really was, the son of the living God. See, he wasn't a man who became God. He was a God who became man. That's a whole big difference right there. So that, he, so that he can bring many sons into glory, all of us, into this place of sonship that he's talking about right here. And we can enjoy his kind of freedom. You know, the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, how is Jesus right now? Is he all bound up? Is he singing in the prison choir? Huh? Is he being in lockdown? Is he under probation? No, none of those things. Listen, Jesus is free indeed, and he whom the Son sets free is just as free as he is. Is he bound up by anything? No. Is he under the oppression of Satan? No, and neither should we be. We can stand our ground and stand against and stand in faith on this gospel message and live this free life right here. Amen. Jesus went down to Capernaum after that and began to preach and proclaim the same gospel message, same word. And you know what? They believed it, and miracles broke out everywhere. Miracles are nothing more than manifestations of freedom. That's what it is. They're manifestations of freedom. God supernaturally breaking chains and bondages off of you that Satan has put around you for probably all your life. You can get free from all of it. But there's one particular incident. Jesus was preaching the gospel in a house. And he got run out of town, run out of synagogues, churches, and all that kind of stuff, I guess. 
But he was preaching in the house, and the place was full. It was packed. It was, it was Pharisees and Sadducees, though. This was not necessarily a, a great crowd right here. These are crowd, this was a crowd full of critics. These are the major, major critics that are going to write in their columns the next day of how bad Jesus was. They were looking to fault find with him. So they didn't come really to receive. But it was full of that. They had come out of all the towns surrounding this. This is Luke chapter 5, very next chapter, verse 17. And it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. What is that saying? The power of the Lord was present to free them from their bondages. Yet yeah, they, were, they were standing there right in front of it, in the midst of the power, and were not aware of it. But there was one guy and his four crazy friends. His four crazy friends brought this paralytic in. And I'll tell you, they got to that, that house that day, and they knew Jesus was in the middle of that house preaching. And they knew this was their time. Praise God. They were expecting. But they got there, and they could find no way to get in. Front door, back door, cellar door, you know, side window, nothing. No way to get to Jesus. But you know what? They were not going to leave empty-handed that day. They were not going to leave and just say, well, you know, I guess it was not the Lord's will for, for us to be healed today. No, I tell you what, they knew it was their day and their hour. They had heard this message before. They heard that Jesus said, today, this is the year of Jubilee. You can have the acceptable year of salvation of the Lord. And so they said, you know what, if there's not, if there's not a way in, there must be a way up top. They went up on top, up and over the law keepers. Up and over the law, they went over and broke a, a place in the middle of that roof and lowered their friend down in the midst before Jesus. That's how much they were expecting. This is what they were believing for. And Jesus said this, man, your sins are forgiven you. Mark's gospel actually says it this way. He said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Again, relationship there. Not just an outsider, but son, your sins are forgiven you. And so, you know, I thought he came for healing. Well, he did, but he needed to be free from the prison house of sin and condemnation in his life first. He needed to walk out of that prison house in order to receive his healing. See, Satan had him bound in that prison house of his sins all, you know, still hanging over his head. He needed to know. Now, that's not when Jesus forgave him, but he needed to know that his sins were forgiven and cleansed like they never even were there. That he was liberated Jesus was going to the cross to take his sin upon himself. And so he says, your, man, your sins are forgiven you. Well, that created an uproar, you know, because all the religious people, they began to reason. They said, who can forgive sins but God alone? In other words, God doesn't do it. God is not willing. He's not gracious. He's not merciful. He's not going to do that. They weren't expecting anything because they didn't know that right there. And so Jesus is answering. He said, why are you reasoning in your hearts among yourselves? He said, which is easier? I love this. Which is easier? He didn't say, which is harder? He said, which is easier? In other words, they're all easy. He said, which is easier to say, man, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up, take up your bed, and go to your house? He said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said, I say to you, take up that bed you're lying on and walk to your house. Jesus forever connected the forgiveness of sin and the healing of our bodies together. In other words, it's all in the same freedom. It was all under the same work. I want you to look at the very last, well, the, the verse after that, verse 26. Look at verse 26, though. This is what I want to get to in that story. Verse number 26. He says, and they were all amazed. I guess so. Because this man took up his bed and walked out in the middle of them. They parted like the Red Sea. And they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things here today. Now listen, that wasn't a strange thing with God. That wasn't a strange thing in heaven. That was strange to them because it was outside of their norm. So what did Jesus come to do? Create a new norm. Whereas the norm under the old covenant was all about bondage. It's all about sin. It's all about condemnation. Been in the prison house. 
not freeing ourselves. The new norm under the, under the new covenant, established by the finished work of Jesus and his shed blood, is all about the forgiveness of sins, restored righteousness, freedom, liberty. It's all about healing. It's all about restoration and wholeness. And see, Jesus wants to establish a new norm in our own country. A normal of freedom. Not externally from a government. If the government granted our rights, they can take them away. Our freedom does not come from them. It comes from God. And because our freedom comes from the highest source, it cannot be taken away. I don't care what kind of law they pass. I don't care what they do. They cannot take my freedom away. I'm going to live a free life because I'm in Christ. Yes. And I've, God has established a new norm for all of us. He wants to establish a new norm, a new lifestyle outside of that box of religion where people's needs are met by God and the kingdom of God and not by the kingdoms of men. Amen. Whatever you trust in, Whatever you put your trust in is going to be the master of your life, one way or another. There's only one master that's going to actually give you freedom, and that's Jesus. Amen. Any other Lord in your life is going to create nothing but bondage, strings attached, everything else in the world. The government may promise a lot of things. But there's always going to be strings attached. Why? Because that's the way men operate. But when we trust in God, there are no strings attached. Amen. Thank God we're free to serve. I don't serve out of obligation. I, I serve because I love God. And I want the same thing that I've experienced to be in everybody else's life. Amen. See, that has to be our commitment. Glory to God. So on this Independence Day, let's commit to the Word to live a free life, but to also be a proclaimer of the gospel that sets men free. Amen. Don't, don't, don't be talked out of it and say, well, that's archaic. I don't want to be old-fashioned, old fuddy-duddy. Listen, it still works. Gravity is pretty old, and it still works. You know that? There's some things that may be old, but they still work. The very fact that it's been around a while tells me it has a record of working. Amen. The more of Jesus we have in our country, the more freedom we're going to enjoy. The less Jesus, the less freedom. The gospel message is all about Jesus, and it's all Jesus-centered. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's all stand and give the Lord thanks today. Hallelujah. Let's thank Him for our freedom. Let's thank Him for our country today. Father, we're just so thankful for the freedoms we enjoy, the country that we enjoy here. But first of all and foremost, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ, the gospel that freed us from everything, from all the bondages, all the oppressions, that we're free to the max. We're free indeed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Y'all can be seated just a moment. We're going to receive communion. We're going to be out of here in just a second. I'm going to take a long time, but I, I decided to do communion at the end because this is a new covenant practice. And of course, we can establish some things around the communion table as we receive these elements today. They're both important. First of all, the broken body, signified by the broken bread, is all about the broken body of Jesus, what he suffered for us on the cross so that we could be free from that oppression, free from that punishment free from sickness and disease in our life. So as we partake of that bread today, we can declare our freedom because of Jesus, because of what he's done. But also, of course, the, the uh, cup representing the blood of Jesus, the all-important forgiveness of sins was because of the blood, not because we earned it, deserved it, did enough stuff to, you know, work it off. It's all about the blood of Jesus, putting our faith in that. And when we mess up, we have to put our faith in Jesus. We're all going to mess up at some point in time, I can tell you. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to do things that are not right. You're going to sin. But listen, at some point, you've got to go back 
and deal with that condemnation, guilt and shame through the right avenue, and that's faith in the blood of Jesus. That frees us from that prison house, keeps us out of Satan's prison house once again. Amen? So as we're doing this today, let's establish some things. Establish freedom in our own life when we partake any of these elements. But also, answer the Lord's pull on your heart, your commitment to the Word and your commitment to be a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Through whatever means and methods the Lord has, has led you to do. You know, a lot of people, they want revival. They want a spiritual awakening. They want all these things. They pray for them, but they're not really committed to, to, to actually seeing that through. It requires work to have a harvest, I can tell you right now. And it's going to require all hands on deck to do what the Lord wants to do in our country. Amen. Every one of us are important. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As we partake of the blood, or the bread this morning, as we break this bread, you receive healing in your body. You receive freedom and deliverance in your life from all bondages of the enemy today. You walk out of that prison house and say, I'm free. You take off those prison clothes and don't you dare go back in that prison bus and go back. Amen. You take of this bread today and you say, I am free to the max. Glory to God. Let's take together. then of course as we're receiving this cup if you messed up if you sin like all of us have you apply faith in this blood right here you apply faith in what Jesus did for you at the cross and you receive the forgiveness of your sin there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ glory to God no condemnation whatsoever no guilt no shame should remain in you if your faith is in the blood you go from sin consciousness to blood washed, right with God, conscious. Let's take together. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. How many free people do we have in here? Free to the max. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We can go out and celebrate true freedom today. Freedom we have in our country, but also your declaration of independence right now where you are free inside and out and all the way around. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's time to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you need an offering envelope, they're located right in front of you. Glory to God. And as you're getting your offerings ready today, and if you're watching this, of course, you're watching this morning. If you're watching, not watching live, you're watching by recording. You can also give, and we would receive that. Praise God. And uh, there's two ways of doing that. You can give online. You can go to our website, church316.org. Go down to the giving icon button, hit that, and it'll take you into a secure location where you can give electronically, safely, online. We would appreciate that. A lot of people are doing that now. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, snail mail, you can send a check in to P.O. Box 1316-1316, Watkinsville, Georgia. 30677. Again, we would definitely appreciate that. Praise God. And God uh, has promised to us that He provides for us all of our needs. We're giving out of His provision. I tell you, what you're doing is just returning to Him some of the things that He's blessed you with in proportion. But you know, He also says when you do that, He's going to turn that around and multiply and give it back to you again. God's all, you're never going to outgive God, will you? Praise God. Hallelujah. So let's hold our offerings up before the Lord. Father, we're just so thankful today that you have blessed us, prospered us, provided for us abundantly. And out of that, Lord, it is our worship. It is our heart to give back to you part, portion of what you blessed us with. But we also know that as we give, that this seed goes forth to produce changes in the lives of other people and also with promise brings back good measure pressed down shaken together running over blessing so that we can in turn be a blessing and give more into the kingdom of God a perpetual blessing coming because we're putting something in motion in our giving today father we're thankful today in Jesus mighty name amen y'all can remain seated just a moment the uh, buckets are on the way and as they are pass through. Praise God. You can
you consider yourself dismissed, remember in the back we have some refreshments. Y'all hang around for a little while. I know it's 4th of July. It's a Connection Sunday as well. Hang around just a little bit. Celebrate our freedom as a body of believers. We'll see you on Tuesday. Amen.